So uh, we're uh, getting to that time of year um, to where uh, we're going to, here on January the 7th, have our annual business meeting. And um, we're also going to have just a quick meeting after church on January the 31st. Um, but the meeting January the 31st um, is going to be uh, to elect um, new leadership uh, into the church. And there are nomination forms on the uh, foyer, uh, the table of the foyer. So as you leave today, and I'll remind you again after church, um, if you'll get one of those nomination forms, you can either turn it in, you can text me uh, your nomination, or you can call me with your nomination, uh, whichever you'd like to do. Um, we are so very thankful for all our leadership uh, in this church, and uh, I'm thankful for um, what our leadership has accomplished, and, and just for always being there. Um, they're always there for me as well. Um, they pray for me, and uh, and and Casey and our family, and as as many and most of you all do. But um, we just know that we we don't let y'all know that you're appreciated. So um, we do have uh, Brother Michael Tittle, um, who has voiced. Uh, his desire to return as the men's leader, um, that, that is a voted upon a position. So um, if, uh, if you want to nominate somebody, that's completely up to you. Um, and then when somebody's nominated, essentially I go and talk to that person and make sure that they want to be uh, on the ballot. So um, we do have uh, three positions that are going to be open. Um, our uh, ladies ministry leader, Sister Amanda Calloway, um, is not going to be returning for next year. She's taking a little bit of a break, but uh, we appreciate everything that she's done in that position. She's just been absolutely amazing. Um, just so we don't have duplicate nominations, um, uh, we do have one current nomination for that position, um, and that is Sister Trisha Portson, and uh, she has accepted that nomination, so um, if there's somebody else you want to put, and that you want to nominate, please, please do so. So, um, Sister Courtney Patton, um, she's going to be taking a break from our children's ministry leadership. Um, we do not have a current nomination for that, um, so uh, be praying, but we appreciate everything Sister Courtney has done, and she has also done an amazing job, and, and I know that that can be quite the task sometimes, um, not only dealing with the kids, but dealing with the adults too. And then uh, Brother Lane and Sister Teresa, um, are not going to be returning as our youth ministry leaders, um, but we do appreciate everything that they've done. And by the way, none of these people are leaving the church or anything. <laughs> They're just stepping down, taking taking you know a break, and um, and we are greatly appreciative of, of the work that Brother Wayne and Sister Teresa have done. They've done an absolutely incredible job, and uh, we thank them for, for their time and their service. We do have a, uh, a nomination uh, currently for our uh, our youth leadership position, and that is Brother Matthew Fortson, and he has accepted that nomination. But as I said, if there's somebody else you pray about and you want to nominate, please you know, fill out the form, text me, call me, let me know. So um, I hate handling business like that, but we've got to. Um, it, it's, it's important. So um, we want the nominations to be turned in. Uh, no later than December the 24th, um, which is Christmas Eve. Um, and yes, we will be having church that Sunday, so make plans to be with us. Um, but that'll give us a week to get everything ready for, um, you know, the um, the voting that will take place on the 31st. Um, it won't take very long. We'll just right after service, we'll you know, take the take the votes, tap them up, and then um, we'll be we'll be good to go, and uh, we'll we'll know who our leaders are for the coming year so um but then keep those two dates in mind right there please do your best i know it's new year's eve do your best to try and be here in service with us that morning um uh so you know not only we can be together and praise the lord but so we can take care of that business and then also uh on january the 7th uh please make plans to to be here with us and um and uh so we can because we're going to have our, our annual business meeting after church um, that Sunday morning. See, okay? I got you. Well, you know, there's nobody busting down the doors to come in. You know, just busting the doors to get out. So um, I, I don't blame them. So 
Um, with that being said, we are also so blessed for the first time in our presence to have Matt and Audra Beox's baby girl with us. Um, amen. Welcome her to the family. Charlotte, right? Her name is Charlotte. So she's a beautiful little baby girl. So if y'all see her out there and, um, you know, take a look and uh, let them know uh, that we, we love them and congratulate them and just, hey, you know, we're, we're growing this church one way or the other. So um, some of y'all need to get with the program. I'm just saying. <laughs> My, my program is done. Uh, I've been enough. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right. Uh, if our children uh, want to be dismissed, they came in this morning. Amen. Didn't our children do such an awesome job singing this morning? They did an amazing job. everybody feeling this morning? Awesome. Um, and just so if, if, it, if it comes across somebody's brain, um, I know that Brother Eric is the, the Grinch of Overthorpe County, so we're not talking about you when I say this, Brother Eric, but apparently the Grinch has visited Mount Pleasant Community Church because we cannot find our Christmas tree decorations. Um, so that's why our tree is bare. So we're either going to find them today or we are going to get new ones. Um, either one way or the other. So this tree will look all nice and spiffy for um, you know our Christmas candlelight service. But if anybody remembers or knows where they are at, please let us know. We've, we've looked about everywhere we know to look. Um, and man, it's, it's not there. So, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll make it. We'll make it. So. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, as as Sister Amanda spoke earlier, we've got still got a lot of people sick, a lot of people that are you know doing some traveling and things like that. And uh, we pray for for God's covering on them, um, and uh, pray for God's healing hand to be on the ones that are that are sick. I know that's like like she said, it's just it's going around everywhere. So, and uh, we pray for covering over our homes uh, of us that are here. And not sit. So, um, but eventually one day we'll have everybody back in this place. <laughs> so, um, today is our uh, our third week in the uh, series, The Promise, and uh, I, I've really enjoyed it so far. I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Um, just to give you a little kind of you know summary, um, kind of take a step back and, and bring you up to speed to where we're at. Um, I know. When, when y'all go watch stuff on like, you know, Netflix or Amazon Prime and stuff like that, those shows, you know, they do like a little recap, right? At the beginning of the show, I'm going to give you just a little bit of recap. Um, the only difference is there's no skip button. All right. Because I don't want to skip the recap. Because a lot of times we get to watching those shows and we watch them, we binge them, right? We watch them one show after the other, right? And you're like, well, I just saw this, so I'm just going to skip it. Well, it's been a little while since we've, we've gathered and had these these messages. So we're going to give a little bit of recap here. Um, our first week, we talked about hope and that we should be active and attentive while we wait on God's promise. Um, many of you remember we talked about Simeon and, and that he would not die until he had seen the promised Messiah. And, and that happened at the temple. But while he was waiting on that day, he was still active and he was still attentive and listening to you know, God's guidance to where he needed to be um, in order to you know see the Messiah. Um, we talked about you know that had he not you know listened to God and went to the temple that day, you know he would have missed his opportunity. But I also think it's important that that we understand that you know that when God moves and when God's promise, you know when it comes about, you know I feel like that God is going to you know. Just put this feeling inside of us that there's there's no denying what is taking place here. And as soon as he laid eyes on this child, he looked at baby Jesus and said, this is the one. This is the one that was spoken of. So we need to be active and attentive while we wait on God's promise and understand that, that Jesus is our hope. That 
We can't have hope in anything else other than Jesus Christ. Um, because everything else will let us down, right? You know, if we, if we have our hope in the world or, or in some kind of leader, you know, or let's be honest, you know, even, even in pastors a lot of times, you know, people might, you know, have their hope in like a pastor or a man of God. But see, the thing is, is that, you know, I'm imperfect. You know, I make mistakes. You know, I, I fail. But Jesus never fails. And so that's why we should put all of our hope into Jesus. And we can have hope because God will always fulfill his promise. Every time. He'll always fulfill his promise. Last week, we talked about the promise that Jesus would be our Prince of Peace. And that peace is not the absence of trouble, but it is the presence of Jesus in the midst of the trouble. Whatever you've got going on, we can have peace in knowing that right there in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your battle, in the middle of your sickness, in the middle of you know your, your depression or anything that you've got going on, Jesus is right there in the midst and he's working whether we know it or not. You know, we sing that song a lot around here, the, the song Waymaker. And, you know, it says, even when I can't see him, he's working. You know, even when I can't feel him, he's working. And I want you to know that you might look around, you know, your life and you might look around your situation and you may see defeat, but there's victory right there in the middle of it. And if we'll just hang on to it and hold on tight, we can have peace in knowing that God not only is going to be there for us, but he'll fight our battles as well. He wants to fight your battle. He wants to go before you so that you don't have to fight, so that you don't have to struggle. But, you know, I feel like that so many times, if y'all are like me, that you're trying to do it on your own. You're trying to make it your own way. And you're trying to say it. And, and, and even some of the times, I mentioned this last week, sometimes the reason we do that is because we say, well, you know, I don't want to bother God with this. I want you to know you're not bothering God. Whatever the situation is, whether, you know, if it's, you know, something, you know, that, that seems, you know, small and, and meaningless or anything like that, or if it's something just life shattering, I want you to know God wants to be a part of it. See, our story is be, being written right now. And, you know, these, these are stories that, you know, these are accounts that people took into place. And I want you to know that God wants to be present in your story. He wants to be seen. He wants to be heard inside of your story. And so we've got to understand that right there in the midst of that, that struggle, that trouble, that situation, that Jesus is right there in the midst. I had said that, you know, Jesus, you know, in, in Isaiah there, and we'll read this verse here in a second. In Isaiah, it says that, that he would be the prince of peace. The prince of peace. Well, I want you to know that Jesus can't be your prince of peace. If he's a missing piece. We'll play on words there. See, when we think about that piece, we think about a puzzle, right? Has anybody ever put a puzzle together and you're missing like one piece and you couldn't find it and it drove you nuts? See, we, what we've got to understand is without that missing piece, without that last piece, the puzzle is not complete. And when we don't have God in our life, when we don't have him working, you know, in every part of our life, we're missing something. We're not whole. Brother Mitch, I want to be whole. You know, I, I want to be full of everything that God wants me to have. So he can't be your prince of peace if he's a missing piece. The verse we were alluding to a while ago is Isaiah 9 and 6. And this is essentially kind of what we've, we've based this series around is this promise in Isaiah where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He wants to be every single one of those things for you. He wants to, he wants you to, to look at him and feel him and know how wonderful he is. He wants to be your counselor. Has anybody ever had to go to counseling before? Maybe some of the husband and wives are like, yeah. <laughs> some, I mean, sometimes, you know, it, sometimes it's necessary to sit down with somebody who, you know, can, can be a mediator and uh, um, that, you know, 
that you know kind of look, can look at things from outside the box. I want you to know that that Jesus, He's all knowing, He's all powerful, and, and He knows your your heart, He knows your mind, and and when we allow Him to counsel us, when we allow Him to you know give us His opinion, then you know what He can speak peace into our life. You know, a lot of us, you know, we've seen, maybe you've experienced this before in your real life, or maybe you've just seen it on, you know, TV and stuff to where when somebody goes to a counselor or a psychiatrist, they, they sit them down, you know, on this couch and, you know, they're, they're real still and they want them to be very comfortable and everything. What they want them to do is they, they want them to feel like that so they will open themselves up. You know, um, if they're in a situation to where, you know, that the, they don't feel, you know, they feel uneasy. They're probably not going to open up. I want you to know that, that God wants you to find comfort in his presence. He wants you to be able to open yourself up to him so that he can bring you peace. Of course, it says that he's the mighty God, the everlasting father. And as we mentioned before, he's the prince of peace. Now, you know, during Christmas time, of course, we are, you know, leading up to celebrating this promise and that promise was the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And, you know, anytime you begin to, to talk about, you know, a birth, there's excitement there. You know, you know there's, there, there's something new. There's something that you've been waiting on. There's something maybe that you've been praying about. And, and I shared this with you, you know, um, a, a few weeks ago. But, you know, when, when we decided that we were ready to start, you know, our... Our family, uh, Casey and I, um, you know, we, we tried to, to get pregnant for several months and it got to the point to where, you know, we thought something may be wrong. And we had been praying about it, you know, during this whole time. And, and honestly, you know, it had never gotten to the point to where I felt hopeless or anything like that. But I can only imagine, you know, somebody that's tried for, you know, several years, um, you know, to get pregnant that, that, you know, you may, you may, may begin to get depressed or not understand, you know, what's going on. And so we were honestly, we were kind of right on the verge. Um, and we were ending uh, the year and um, that was 2013, nearing the end of the year. And, and I told her, I said, you know, look, I said, I said, when we get into the new year, and I said, if something hasn't happened, then, you know, we'll, we'll go see what's going on. You know, we'll go, go to a doctor. And um, I'm so thankful that that God began to move in, in our situation. And on Thanksgiving morning of 2013, Casey took a pregnancy test and it said that she was pregnant. So um, it was a very, very happy Thanksgiving. We were excited. We were nervous all at the same time. It, isn't that crazy that you know you're 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 trying, you know, you're you know trying to get pregnant and you want to get pregnant, but then when you hear that it's you know it's it's about to happen, you're like, oh no. Boy, when they're born, screaming and crying and won't sleep and stuff like that, and you're changing dirty diapers and, and all this mess, you're really wondering, what in the world did we do? Why did we pray so hard for this? But every one of us in here that are parents, you know, you'll understand that even though that baby's crying, even though you're having to change diapers, that you look down and you've never experienced so much joy from someone as a child. A child brings so much joy to your life. And, and you look at that child and you look at something that, that God created and that God made possible. And we've got to understand that, you know, that love that we feel inside for that child, that that's the same set of eyes that God's looking at us through. See, we are his children and he loves us just like that. He loves us unconditionally. But it's a, a much greater love that even we could have for our children. We can't even fathom the amount of love that God truly has for us. And so this morning, I know a lot of times during this time of year we, we talk about the birth of Christ. But I want you to know that there was another birth around the same time that, that it brought joy to a certain family. And it was all part of God's plan. We read Isaiah 9 and 6. Well, in Isaiah 9, 
2 through 3, kind of jumping up a few verses. And it's talking about the children of Israel here. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So I want you to know that, that there is joy that's being promised here to the children of Israel. It says, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. See, God wants to bring joy to our lives. And I love here, it says, they rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. Anytime you have multipl multiplication in your life, um, as long as it's not bills, all right, um, normally there's there's joy there. You know, when you have, you know, new babies come about, you know, um, you know, maybe when, you know, you have, you know, you get a promotion at work or something like that, you know, when there's multi multiplication, there's joy. I'm struggling with that word this morning. But if you read in Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5, it says that there is going to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. It says, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, a lot of people might look at this and, and they may say, well, you know, you know, is this talking about Jesus? You know, who's this talking about? See, it's not talking about Jesus here because it says that it says this voice of the one crying in the wilderness is going to be preparing the way for the Lord. It's going to be making straight in the desert a highway for our God. It's going to be blazing a path. I watched a movie the other night to where this guy, his job was to, um, you know, he, he ran a snowplow and, and he would literally, and I can't remember exactly where it was in the country, but boy, there was a lot of snow. And you couldn't go down the road unless this snowplow went down first. And so every morning he would go down with that snowplow so that people, you know, could get from one place to another. So there was going to be somebody, you know, preparing the way so that other people could receive the gift of being able to go where they needed to go. And here we talk about one that's going to be preparing the way. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 1, what we're going to talk about this morning, if you haven't caught on, is, of course, our series of promise, but we're going to talk about the subject of joy. Joy. And I'm not talking about the dish show. All right? That'll preach a little bit. You know, joy can bring cleansing and things like that. But we're going to be talking about something a little different this morning. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Matt, you posted on Facebook the other day about that it was important that we read all the names um, when, whenever we read, you know, the Christmas story. And, and I'm going to be honest, I'm one of those that a lot of times I'll just jump down and, and I've read them before, but I'll just jump down right into the story, right? See, I'm the type of person that, you know, I want to get into like the meat and the potatoes, you know, um, you know, but it's important that, that we understand the lineage and how God worked it out so that, that Jesus could show up on the scene and see Jesus, it says that he was from the house of David. Well, you got to understand here. If you look, it says that, that, you know, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, of Aaron. Now, many of you might not remember this, but Aaron was the first high priest. Aaron was right there, you know, beside Moses, and, and, and he was, you know, our first high priest. So it says that, that his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. It says, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. 
and they were both well advanced in years. Now, when I read this verse right here, it says, but they had no child. There's, there's a part of me that, that when I read this, I, I begin to, you know, think about, you know, my situation and in other people's, you know, situations to where, you know, that they tried and tried and tried and it seemed like it, it never happened. And there comes a time to where, you know, you get to a point where you just, you don't feel, you don't feel whole because, you know, there's something that you want so badly. But it says that Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. It, it sounds like that, that they had kind of given up, right? It sounds like that they had lost hope and that they had, had given up on and, and they, they had settled with the fact that, you know what, we're not going to have a child. You know, we're, we're too old. You know, we've been trying this thing. It's not happening. You know, we're not going to have a child. But then you go to verse 11 and it says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Does that sound familiar? We talked about those shepherds last week, right? And, and that the shepherds, when the angel appeared before them, the first thing the angel had to say was, do not be afraid. Right? How many of y'all want to see Jesus? I absolutely want to see Jesus. But you know what? As I said last Sunday, if he were to come marching through that door right there right now, it, I might be a little freaked out, you know, at first. He might have to speak some peace into me and say, hey, do not be afraid. Calm down. It's just me. But I have no doubt that, that when Jesus, when he speaks, that comfort will come through in his voice and it'll give us peace. It says in verse 13 here, it says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. That sounds like good news right there, doesn't it? It sounds like amazing news. And, and honestly, you know, if, if we receive news like this, you know, we want to go, you know, tell somebody, you know, when we receive good news, you know, most of the people now, you know, they put it on Facebook so that all the world can see, so that everybody can hear our good news, right? Now, some people are a little different. You know, some people like to stay reserved and things like that, but that doesn't mean that there's not joy there. There's still excitement. Um... I know that one of the things that we've always done, we were, we were so excited, you know, when we found out that, you know, we were going to be having Stafford, but we wanted to wait a little while because the early, you know, weeks, you know, of that pregnancy are very vital and we didn't want to jump the gun and, and then put the information out there and then have to turn around and tell everybody, you know, Hey, it's not going to happen. Um, so we, we waited a while before we, you know, just put that information out. Um, but, you know, not everything's like that in life. You know, if you're told at work, you know, that you're getting a promotion and that, you know, you start next week, you know, we're going to be excited about it. We're going to go and start telling people, you know, pick up the phone. You ain't going to believe what happened to me. That's the way we work. And that's, and that's awesome. It's important that we have joy like that. But, you know, when God does something in our life, we need to make sure that, you know, we have that that joy, but we need to make sure that he receives the credit. We need to make sure that, that people know, hey, you know, I thank God for what he's do, done in my life, what he's doing right now. So this was an exciting time. And it says in verse 15, it says, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Incredible. Even from Elizabeth's womb, John was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. So amazing. It says in verse 16, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zacharias had a lot to be excited about. He had a, had a lot to look forward to. But then in verse 18, it says, And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. He began to question God, right? His, his disbelief, see, see, Zacharias believed in God, but there was a sense of disbelief right here in this moment to where he was wondering, you know, how in the world is this going to happen? Because, you know, I'm looking at my situation, you know, I, I know, you know, who I am and, and how old I am and what, what's been going on, you know, what's going to change? How's it going to change? You know, we sang that song this morning. Nothing is impossible for God. Now, it sounds nice to say, but has anybody ever been in this place to where you went through a situation to where that disbelief began to rise up and you said, I just don't know how God's going to work this out. I, I don't know, you know, what's going to happen. You know, I, I don't know. And, and it begins to steal your joy, right? It begins to, to hurt you, you know, on the inside. And what that will do is, is, is that hurt that begins to take place and that disbelief will begin to affect your worship. It will begin to affect your, your everyday walk. And it will affect your joy. The joy you should have that only comes from Jesus Christ. You know, I begin to think about, you know, the story in the Bible where, you know, many of us have, have heard this story, but, you know, the man says, you know, you know, I, I believe, help my disbelief. It sounds kind of weird, right? Well, Zacharias was going through the same thing. He believed in God, but there was some disbelief there that needed to be overcome. Now, this is kind of crazy. But I want you to hang with me, okay? He said this to the angel in verse 19. It says, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. That's kind of tough right there, right? I mean, you know, I told y'all before that, you know, I, I did some things that, you know, that I got in trouble for, you know, when I was younger. And, you know, I got spankings and I got in trouble and got put in time out and got stuff taken away from me and different things like that. But, you know, I'm talking about, you know, that I got, you know, maybe my, my Nintendo, you know, taken away from me or couldn't watch TV for a week or something. You know, this guy right here, he says, you know, you ain't going to be able to say nothing until this baby comes forward. That had been tough. Now, Elizabeth may have loved it. Um, let's be honest. You know, Elizabeth may have said, you know, this is the greatest thing ever. Can I, can I get an amen from the women? Yeah. Anybody? Anybody? You know, there's an old story about um, there was a man and, and, and he had a uh, he had a wife and she just grumbled all the time. She just seemed like she was never happy, never had any joy. Everything was a problem. And he prayed. He said, God, he said, could you, could you please make it where I don't have to hear her grumbling all the time and everything? So God took his hearing. Be careful what you pray for. Be very specific when you pray. All right. So his, his ability to speak was taken away. And can you imagine receiving news like this? That this amazing thing was going to happen? And that you couldn't go out there and you couldn't rejoice? And you couldn't tell everybody and, you know, be all ex excited because your, your voice has been taken? It would have been hard. You know, Zacharias didn't have Facebook, you know, obviously. 
You know, he may have, you know, went and took some stone or something and, you know, chiseled it out, you know, and tell, told somebody, you know, or maybe they knew sign language back then, I'm not sure. But that had been tough to have something so exciting, you know, that you're right there in the middle of and, and you can't go out there and rejoice. Now, he was doing this because he was being punished. I want you to know this morning that obviously our joy comes from God, but the devil wants to steal your joy. And the way that he wants to punish you is he wants to take your voice. He wants to take your voice and he wants to take your worship. He wants to steal all that. And I want you to know that if we allow him to, he will. Because there are a lot of things in our life that, you know, that we have that, you know, that, that we should be so thankful for and that we should be, you know, rejoicing for. But the devil makes it seem like it's hard to rejoice a lot of times. And he'll take your voice. He'll take your joy if you allow him to. Now, of course, now we're getting ready for, for this birth that's about to take place. And... Elizabeth just happened to be cousins with Mary, mother of Jesus. So there's two births that are going to take place kind of near each other that, that are very important. And it says in verse 39 of Luke 1, it says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a, to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't begin to describe to you how crazy that would have been right there and how awesome. I mean, can you imagine, you know, Mary, you know, comes in with Jesus inside of her womb and that Jesus is so powerful that, that it caused John to leap inside of her body? And I know, I know the, the ladies in here that have been pregnant, it's like, no, that's not awesome, Levi. You know, I have felt some of those leaps and turns. But it says that not only was John going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from her womb, but right here in this verse, it says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's how, that's how God works. When we get in the presence of of Jesus Christ and when we draw close to him his spirit you know it can cause us to leap and and that Holy Spirit can begin to take over and and I tell you what it's, it's life changing if you've never experienced you know the power of the Holy Ghost in your life you're missing out I mean it, it gives you the ability to overcome anything because it's it's Jesus coursing through your veins he's moving in your blood so it says that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42 there, it says, Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. He leaped for joy. It says, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. I want you to know this morning that God wants to cause somebody in this place this morning to feel like they can leap again. And, you know, I begin to, I begin to think about, you know, that, that word leap and, and kind of how we view things, you know, in, in our modern times. And, and a lot of times there are things that, that we feel like, you know, that we are called to do and we feel like that we have been, you know, that, you know, obviously, you know, honestly, we were born to do. And sometimes a fear begins to come up inside of us and it begins to make us question, you know, what, what we truly are here for. And a lot of times what we end up having to do is we just have to take the plunge. We just have to dive, you know, head first right into it, you know, and, and we have to, you know, walk, 
you know, into, you know, whatever calling God has called us into. And when I begin to think about that word leap there, you know, there's, there's some kind of joy that God wants to bring into somebody's life. And he's, he's waiting for you to draw close to him so that he can cause you to leap into wherever you're supposed to be. He can cause you, you know what? I'm not going to try to leap in this place. I don't want to. My foot ain't feeling too great, but I don't mess up the floor or scare anybody. But, you know, we used to play this, this game, you know, back in school called hopscotch, right? Who enjoyed hopscotch? Anybody? I love hopscotch. Um, maybe not as much as Red Rover um, because, uh, believe it or not, I've always been, you know, pretty big. And so I would go barreling through there, man, and I'd try to break arms, you know. I'd let them know they weren't getting me. Used to love Red River. But hopscotch, you know, you go out there and, you know, and you do this little thing where you jump from one, you know, and you got the two feet, one foot, and all that stuff. But we also used to play this game where we used to try and jump as far as we could. And, and that can be kind of scary as well. Because, uh, you know, a lot of times if you jump and you land just right on kind of the back of your feet, you'll slip and you'll hit the back of your head. So it can be scary. You know, sometimes it's a scary thing to, to try and jump from one place to another and, and try to make that, that big leap. But I want you to know that, that God is going to be right there in the midst, holding your hand when you take that leap. And, and I want you to know that there's going to be joy, you know, that comes from that leap. And that we don't have to be scared to take the leap. He's right there with us. He said he'd never leave us. He'd never forsake us. So I'm wondering if somebody will leap this morning. If you will leap into your joy. We jump down to verse 57. It says, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered. And she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. See, right there in the middle of that word, rejoice, that J-O-I, the, the root of that is joy. They rejoiced. All right, they were, they were glad. They were happy. They were excited. And it said that they rejoiced with her. And, and I want you to know that it's important this morning that, that not only that, that we understand that God wants to bring us and give us joy, but he wants us to rejoice with everyone else. When they get that joy, when they find it, he wants us to be together. In verse 59, it says, so it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. See, that was custom in those days to, to be named, you know, after your father or after a close relative, sometimes maybe a, you know, a brother or, you know. Um, an aunt or an uncle or a grandpa or somebody like that to take on that family name. And it says that they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. But they said to her, no, excuse me, there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father. Sign language was a thing. All right. And in nine months he had learned. It says they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet. See, I told y'all. I think they had ink. I was just kidding about the, the stone, but a writing tablet. But it says that he wrote saying his name is John. So they all marveled. I love how right here, when, it, when he, he gives this verse right here, that where he writes on this tablet, it says that his name is John. Not, you know, well, we think we're going to call him John. You know, like there's some uncertainty or anything like that. But it says his name is John. He was very to the point and there's no questioning. His name is John. So they all marveled. And in verse 64, it says, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loose and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them. And all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. 
And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. I can go ahead and tell you, I think that Zacharias was already filled with joy when he held his little baby there. He held that promise. But boy, when, when he was obedient to what God had told him to and named that baby John, and his tongue was loosed, and he could speak again, it says the first thing he did was start rejoicing. He started rejoicing. Now, some of us, some of us, you know, might go as far, and I, I know some people that might be like this, you know, that if they got their tongue loosened, they're like, what in the world was that? This is some absolute mess. You know, why could I not speak when I'm, and start complaining that he didn't do this? He rejoiced. Because he got back what he had lost. Can you imagine going your whole life being able to speak and then all of a sudden you can't speak? That would have been tough. That would have been hard. And so it says that he rejoiced here and that word began to spread all amongst Judea. And people began to wonder, you know, you know, what kind of amazing child, what kind of amazing things is this child going to do that, that, you know, that a man was healed? In his presence. Well, we've got to understand that all of this was talked about in Isaiah. I know the angel had came and, and spoke to Zacharias, but this was foretold of many years before. If we go back to, or actually not back, but if we jump forward to Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. See, God promised, and this is God's promise coming to life. I want you to know that there's some things that God has promised to you that you haven't seen yet. You haven't seen them come to full life or you haven't seen them come full circle. I want you to know, keep on praying, keep on waiting and have joy in the process. Have joy in the process of knowing that God's at work. This story is just so incredible. Because we read this in Isaiah, that there was going to be one whose voice was going to be crying from the wilderness. And it says here, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. See, just like that snow plow, he was preparing people's minds and he was preparing people's hearts for what they were about to experience. And that was the encounter that they had with Jesus Christ. In John 1 and 29, John was preaching somewhere, ministering to the people. And it says the next day that John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as many of us know the story, Jesus, he approaches John. And he says, you know, he says, I want you to baptize me. And John says, no, I'm the one that should be baptizing. You know, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no. He says, I have to do this. I need you to do this so that you can fulfill, that you can fulfill what is about to take place. And it says that, that John, that he baptized Jesus right there in that river Jordan. And it says a dove ascended. Just like, just like John had been prophesied to that, that the dove would ascend on him. And it says a voice spoke down from heaven. It says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It's awesome to see things that God has promised come forth. And I want you to know that we can read them in this book and, and it can make us feel all good inside and we can read stories like this and like, man, you know, that is just incredible. But I want you to know that 
as I said earlier, you've got a story too. And that God wants to fulfill his promises in your life. And he wants you to understand that, you know, that, that word of God, that Bible, it's not a fairy tale. It's not something that we read at night to, to make us, you know, you know, feel all good inside or anything like that. You know, so, so we can have happy thoughts, you know, or anything. This stuff really happened. And if, and if you truly believe that word of God, then you'll understand that, that not only was Jesus born, not only did he die, not only was he raised, but he's coming again. He's coming again. And I want you to know that God has placed joy in our life. And he has given us a sense of rejoicement to where what we can do is we can go around. And just as John the Baptist helped prepare the way for Jesus Christ and, and his coming onto the scene, that we can help prepare the ones around us. For his second coming. We can help prepare hearts. We can prepare minds. And the way that we do that. Of course is from the love of Jesus. But it's got to come from the joy of Jesus too. You know. It can't be some. You know. You know. Oh yeah. Jesus did this. You know. It's, it's, he's so great. I don't know about y'all. But when I get excited about something. I get excited. You know, I mean, we, we start talking about, you know, some good places to eat in here. And I begin to talk, you'll hear it in my voice. You know, I, you know, I, I love, you know, good places to eat. I love good food. You know, we begin to talk about, you know, you know, Georgia football and different things like that. And, uh, yeah, right now, you know, you know, we might have some different things to say with Mitch. You know, we just got beat for the first time in, you know, forever. But I still love them. They, you know, they bring, they bring joy into my life and different things like that. But I want you to know that all of that joy is meaningless. It can't do anything for me. You know, I can have all the money in the world. I can have the biggest house. I can have all these different things, all this material wealth, and it would not mean anything. First of all, it can all be taken away just like that. Somebody could come, a bank could come, you know, and take it away. Somebody could steal your identity and things like that, and you can have everything stripped from you. But what they can't take is the joy of Jesus Christ in your life. They can't take it. It can't be bought. And it can't be taken away. I want you to know that, that when we're telling people about Jesus, we've got to have that excitement inside of us. We've got to let people see his light and it shine from us. Don't hide it. Let it shine. Let it shine so people can see. And let it help prepare them. Let it help prepare them for his second coming but also prepare them for the promises that, that God has in store for their life. And I want you to know this morning that he's got, he's got so much more for us than we could ever imagine. And I wonder at times, you know, how much are we missing out on because of either disobedience or disbelief or just not having the joy that we should have. See, y'all heard me say this many times, that, you know, God is not going to trust us with more if he can't trust us with what he's already given us. Well, I want you to know the same, same kind of concept is that, that God's not going to pour out more if we're not thankful for what he's already poured out into our life. We've got to let him know that we're thankful. We've got to let him know that, that we have joy. And we've got to understand that our joy and our strength comes from him and nothing else. It says in Nehemiah 8 and 10, and this, this verse really reminded me of the Christmas season, honestly. But it says, this is Nehemiah. It says that he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I begin to think about, you know, that, you know, you know, that word Merry Christmas, you know, and people say, you know, you know, be merry, 
you know, and, and this just reminds me of Christmas time is that, you know, as we're, we're gathering together and, you know, we're, we're eating these, you know, extravagant meals and, you know, we're eating the fat, drinking the sweet, you know, hot chocolate, things like that. But then it says, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. See, this is a season of giving that we're in. And I love, I love the fact that, you know, a lot of places really ramp up their giving during Christmas time. But it shouldn't be just that time of the year. We are blessed to have a church that I feel like that we, one of our, you know, one of the good things that we do is that we give throughout the year. And we're blessed to be, you know, partnered with people like the Kaya House, you know, that, that help our community so much. And it's not just during Christmas. But it does seem like this time of year, it really, you know, goes into, you know, full swing, full effect. And I want you to know that just as this verse says, it says, do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want you to know that when we go out and we give to these people, when we begin to minister to them and, and tell them of the goodness of God and tell them that God loves them, you know, we're doing that from that joy that resides inside of us. And that joy that all stems from Jesus. If you'll stand with me this morning. I told y'all earlier that I got spankings when I was little. And uh, man, I did things that really made my dad, you know, scratch his head. And even to the point now where he doesn't have, a, he's got a little bald spot right here probably because he's doing this. It's probably, it's, it's my fault. I'll take the blame. And there was many times that, you know, I, I could sense, you know, that I did something really stupid and I could sense his anger, his disappointment. I could also feel it through the belt. You know, I've told y'all many times that one thing that my dad did is that, you know, right there in that, in that moment, that he never failed to punish me or discipline me and not follow it up with saying, letting me know, reassuring me how much he loved me and that he didn't enjoy doing this. But the reason that he did it was so I would learn how to act right. You know, this next verse, that this last verse I want to leave you with, a lot of people in here this morning, you may have done things that you're ashamed of. You know, you, you may have thought that, you know, that you made God angry, and maybe you did. I, you know, I don't know. You have to take that up with God. But it might have been hard for us to come back knowing what we had done. It might have been hard for us to, to put ourselves back in His presence knowing that we had fell short. But I want this verse to reassure you this morning, and I want it to help build you. Build the joy inside of you because in Psalms 30 and 5 it says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. You know, I've always had this weird way of thinking about things, Brother Mitch. Sometimes I, I think outside of the box and sometimes it's way outside the box. And people say, what in the world caused me to think that? My mind could be a dangerous place. But when I read this verse right here, and it says, but joy comes in the morning. When I think about the morning time, especially now, I wake up and I head on my way out to work and it's dark. And while I'm on my way out to work, transitioning from one place to the next, that sun is continuously rising. And I get to watch the sunrise. And by the time I get to work, it's risen. And it's there. And it, 
goes every day like that. The sun goes down, the sun comes back up. I want you to know this morning that you may feel like you're walking around in the darkness. You may feel like that you don't have any joy inside of you. I want you to know that morning's coming and that sun's going to rise again. And you can have joy just in that fact that Jesus said he would never leave us, that he would never forsake us. But I want you to know that, that we're going to see him come back again and we're going to look into the sky and he's going to call us up to be with him. Now, another thing from the sun is that not only do you see the light, but you also feel the warmth, right? You feel the warmth of the sun. I want you to know this morning that God wants somebody to feel that warmth this morning. You know, you may you may feel like you've got a hardened heart that it's cold and, and maybe it's from shame or, or maybe it's from unforgiveness or bitterness or something like that. I want you to know that, that God, He wants to shine on your life and He wants to to melt all that. He wants to melt it all away so that you can feel freedom in this house this morning and so that you can experience joy. We're going to open up this altar here in a second. And if maybe you feel like a part of your joy has been ripped away from you, don't, don't go another day longer without that. Find your joy again. Let God ignite something within you this morning. So that you know what? Not only will people feel the warmth from Him, but they'll feel it from us too. They'll feel the warmth of the Holy Ghost shining from our life. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that in this house this morning, God, you would begin to speak to us. God, you would give us guidance. God, I pray that you would prepare hearts and prepare minds for what's going to take place next, not only this morning, but in our lives. Jesus, I pray that you would just minister to the needs that are in this house. God, I pray that we feel your warmth this morning. And God, I pray that if there's somebody in here this morning that's struggling, God, that you would draw them to this place, dear Lord. God, so that you could reignite joy back into their life, dear Lord. And you can bring it all full circle. God, we give you the praise and the glory for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. This altar's open, friend. Don't wait a day any longer without your joy. If you want to come spend some time in prayer, I urge you to do so.